So um, the expansion of digital platforms into a wide range of economic sectors has been a phenomenon in the wake of 2008 financial crisis, which reinforces the neoliberal trend of labor casualization worldwide. The question of how digital platforms shape work, work conditions and affect the labor struggles have attracted a growing interest across disciplines. Some argue that algorithms become the new boss and that the matchmaking platforms for on-demand services give rise to uh, what Jim uh, Stanford called a uh, quote, resurgence of gig work, which poses various of regula regulatory challenges for the existing labor laws. Others argue that the platform um, economy did no more than exacerbating workers' precarity and reproducing the gender and racialized the capitalistic uh, production. Still others pointed to waves of worker organizing and activism and argue for novel ways of disrupting the digital economy. So my talk today is concerned with digitalization and transformation of work in China since the nation's integration into global capitalism. From being the key location in the global supply chain for manufacturing to being one of the most popular destinations for capital investment in the global uh, digital capitalism. So you might have noticed that I did not use the term platformization, instead I use uh, digitalization. Because as I will demonstrate, uh, I consider the transformation of work in the platform economy to be the outcome co-shaped by multiple historical forces, not merely um, somehow by uh, uh, the extension of uh, the platform logic. So my talk consists of four parts. Uh, first, I will give you a very quick uh, overview of the historical continuation and the current state of gig work in China, uh, just in case that you are not familiar with the Chinese context. Uh, then second, I will introduce uh, very briefly my approach toward the digital platforms, uh, which is uh, embedded in the history and the society. And the third, I will discuss the global conditions that intertwine to shape the current state of the workforce in the platform economy in China and their characteristics. The, correct, the characteristics of digitization of, of work in China have profound uh, implications and significance for labor politics in the country, as well as in, in the entire world. So I will conclude the talk by dis the discussing some of the uh, implications. So gig work, well, or casual work, has a long history in China. So in days of, well, uh, even, even before uh, the, uh, the uh, Republic of China, but here I just uh, uh, present uh, one specific term, uh, which I got from the newspaper, uh, from the days in uh, 19, uh, 1933, uh, in the days of Republic China. So people were found in the popular congregating areas, such as temples, in the villages and cities across the country, looking for day jobs to supplement family income or make a living. They were known as, uh, here, uh, they were known as casual worker or uh, called sanpong, or literally meaning all the jobs or casual workers simultaneously. And the marketplace where they got hired were known as uh, commercial houses for work uh, or in, Kent in Canton province or marketplace for labor in Northern China. So the rate for these casual workers were negotiated case by case based on the season, the supply on the day, the job and the skills of the workers. So fast forward to the post-socialist China, which is the second stage here, uh, on the way to become the world, world factory, uh, the migrant workers from rural areas in China who constitute the main workforce to produce and sustain the global consumer culture have become the frequent research subjects since the late 1990s for sociologists, pol political scientists, and other scholars who are interested in China's transition and transformation. So these workers are often studied through the lens of informal work, foregrounding their state of unstable income and the lack of institutional labor protection and social insurance. For example, a Chinese sociologist named uh, Zhou Daming studied the day labor in China and called them, uh, quote, free workers at the margin of the city. Then in the contemporary China, other terms have gained uh, attractions to describe the platform-based service workers in the digital economy, such as flexible jobs, 
or flexible workers or in, in the Chinese government or, or official lexicon, there is actually a, a official ter uh, term is called the new forms of employment, uh, or uh, uh, However, abundant research has shown that the informality remains to be the norm for those platform-based workers from, you know, from the, the era of informal work to the platform economy. And they struggle those problems no differently from migrant workers in manufacturing. So indeed, workers' precarity continues. Nonetheless, when the dominant informal workforce encounters the capitalistic accumulation embodied in the financialized platform economy, the scale and the shifts in the labor market in China uh, is still very remarkable. So the number of Chinese workers in platform-mediated environments is estimated to be 84 million, according to the State, uh, state in, uh, Information Center's report. Uh, however, in March this year, China's uh, premium, uh, premium Li uh, said that, I quote here, more than 200 million workers are in flexible uh, employment. During the press conference of the fourth uh, session of the 13th National People's Conference in Beijing, and the Premier Li urged the more social protection for those precarious workers. So I did a calculation based on these two numbers. That's about um, um, anywhere between 9.4% to 22% of the country's entire workforce. I'm going to talk about the significance of what this figure means uh, later in my talk. So my question is, how can we really comprehend the wave of digitization of work in China, particularly concerning the expansion of digital platforms? So my approach uh, towards digital platforms has been uh, informed by scholars like Anna Singh, uh, Jane Geyer, and Adrian Ethik. For example, Ethik suggests the importance of geography and history in understanding the evolution of platform capitalism and argue that the market system in the platform economy is dependent on and interacting with the existing other uh, markets. I also drew uh, from Anna Singh's work on globalization uh, uh, or, and, uh, and her ideas to connect multiple forces at different scales from the local to national to transnational and consider, I quote, I quote Singh here, uh, the making and remaking of geographical and historical agents and the form of their agency in relation to movement, interaction, and shifting, competing claims about community, cultural, and the scale, end quote. Here, I am interested in attending to those, according to Singh, uh, the making and the remaking of geographical and historical agents and how their agentic uh, practices prompt us to delineate the global conditions and treat them as the conditions of possibilities for the digital platforms, rather than assuming there is some sort of like dominant order or logic extended from the, uh, um, uh, the platforms, especially from the point of the technology. So this point, you know, consider the, uh, the different uh, conditions, those conditions actually shape the digital economy and the platform-based labor politics is especially relevant to the labor issues uh, in digital economy, which entails the embeddedness of a platform uh, mediated arrangement of work in the global conditions and a recognition of platform capitalism's dependence on the existing market, labor practices, and the social, economic, and the political conditions. So now uh, let's turn to uh, global conditions first. So uh, since China's economic reform and opening up to the global capitalism in the 1970s, a rapid economic development gives rise to a booming urban consumer economy and an expansion of capital in the forms of state capital and domestic private capital. The latter plays an important facilitator role in the investment hunger environment for the tech startups and allows for massive institutional investment in the telecom infrastructures. China's economic growth, the government's promotion and the practices of, of uh, developmentalism and later digital developmentalism and the institutional investment in the infrastructure become a source of inspiration for many other de developing countries, which aspire to quote unquote leapfrogging uh, their nation's position in the global economic structure. 
And it also has become a, a source of anxiety for other countries, or which dominant the globe, uh, for, for other countries, uh, where uh, the in informal uh, economic structure also dominates. So if we only consider the compositions of Chinese uh, labor force, China has gone has undergone industrialization and deindustrialization de with, uh, within a span of 40 years. The transformation of what uh, of which is inseparable from China's participation in the globalization of production. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, in 1978, when China started you know, its market-oriented uh, economic reform by, inter by integrating uh, into the global capitalism, workers in manufacturing and the service sectors counted for about 17.3% um, and 12%, respectively, of the total workforce. By 2000, the world factory China has about 23% of its workforce in manufacturing and 27.5% in service sectors. However, in, in 2018, more than 46% of the labor force uh, were in uh, service sector, while the manufacturing workers have been declining to about like 26% of the work, workforce. Platform mediated service sectors have rapidly expanded to absorb those informal workforces flowing out from manufacturing. Further financial libera uh, liberation since uh, 2009 makes China's internet sector, among others, uh, the magnet for foreign and domestic capital. According to one estimation, uh, VC investments climbed from 12% of the global VC market in China in 2009 to 20% in 2017, with the percentage of domestic capital increasing from 42% to 81% during the same period. Uh, take the example of the leading ride hailing platform uh, named the Didi, uh, uh, for instance. It has attracted more capital investment prior to its IPO, which turns out to be a fiasco lately, than Uber did. Uh, and uh, in the food delivery sector, the leading uh, platform is called Meituan. And for the check hailing logistics sector, uh, the platform called Mangbang, they all got billions of investment before their public offering. So the massive inflow of capital heightened the prevailing business model of growth before profits for the platform companies. States embrace of digital uh, developmentalism, which considers digital platforms to be conducive to upgrading the economy, help create a permissive regulatory environment for platform companies. As I wrote elsewhere, um, I actually put, put a citation here. Uh, I elaborated uh, the discourses like new forms of employment actually help legitimize the platform companies' brazen violation of labor laws. Uh, or other regulations, and, and building a, uh, I, I use the term mirage of participation in the new digital economy, actually help uh, uh, distract uh, attentions away from the lagging structural changes to labor protections and the, the widening uh, social and economic inequality. So these factors, these factors are uh, intertwined to shape the trajectory of the development of platform economy and the transformation of work in China. So I'll be focusing on four uh, interrelated uh, characteristics. The transition from socialist to post-socialist system in China gives rise to a proliferation of employment relations and a stratified system of social benefits, a pattern of which actually, again, persists in the digital um, economy. Two quick uh, examples here. First is uh, I will first focusing on the two first the two characteristics. Uh, the example I'm going to present include uh, the types of drivers uh, on the ride hailing platforms. So uh, in China, um, taxi drivers are actually using. If we're talking about Didi, you know the dominant platform, uh, taxi drivers are also using the same uh, platform as uh, private hire drivers. So the types of uh, drivers on the ride hailing platforms, including the traditional taxi drivers. However, in the existing uh, taxi industry, there are, have already like, been quite fragmented. So, so there are uh, the employees at the state-owned enterprise, which is uh, taxi companies, 
uh, who actually enjoyed uh, uh, for uh, institutional benefits and uh, employment related uh, social insurance. However, there are also taxi drivers hired by uh, private companies uh, uh, or taxi drivers who are actually self-employed. Um, they can all uh, use uh, the same platform uh, to get services, you know, to uh, fulfill orders. Uh, then there are also the drivers, uh, private drivers for the premium services, uh, including uh, the full-time employees which were hired by the platform. I put the uh, I put the fund in red because uh, they no longer exist, and this also happened to the food food delivery on my next slide. So the full time food employee, and then uh, there are there are also uh, subcontracted full time uh, drivers hired by rental or uh, franchised fleet companies, which actually you know contract with the ride hailing platforms. However, there are also uh, private drivers uh, actually joining the program, uh, getting some loans, uh, uh, joining the program sponsored by the uh, light hailing platform, which is called Rental to Purchase. And they are at a very high risk of uh, void and the bankruptcy because they are often get into debt. And uh, when the market kind of like goes south, they found that they have been struggling with uh, making ends meet. And of course, there are ordinary private individual uh, private drivers uh, work as independent contractors uh, on the right hailing platforms. However, within that group, there are those who ha have actually uh, uh, applied for uh, the legal licenses and there, there are other groups of like non-licensed drivers. So, and uh, there is also uh, private drivers, independent contractor drivers. Again, they are divided into a uh, licensed group and uh, a non-licensed group. So my point here is, these highly uh, fragmented labor market in China, it, it is actually related to uh, the legacy of a highly localized uh, taxi industries and the, which is already strat stratified uh, on multiple fronts. And uh, uh, it, it is also had something to do with the multi-headed industrial regulations related to uh, taxi industry. Again, it is uh, the, the, the central regulatory body of the, of the nation state delegate the regulation to the local, uh, to the municipal level. So different cities have their different policies to regulate, you know, uh, right hailing platforms and uh, the platforms operating locally will sub subcontract uh, the labor relations to different third parties and uh, which generates, you know, these, as you can see, very heterogeneous uh, composition of drivers. So it is also uh, because of because of the uh, P2P lending platform that's related uh, in this market. It is actually also expanded to other uh, other markets, including you know uh, personal loans and uh, uh, vehicle rentals, etc. And the, the second example, very similarly, is in the food delivery uh, workers. So I presented uh, the, the the different types of uh, of riders uh, in a different way. So uh, again, there are so many different types of riders. And, uh, and again, the platform hired riders, which only appeared at the very beginning of the uh, development stage of platform companies, uh, they once exist and the workers enjoyed, you know, base salary, uh, social security contributions paid by the platform as well as themselves. And, uh, uh, and, uh, they, and they normally work uh, in a more fixed uh, schedule, um, but they no longer exist because they have the full access to the institu institutional labor uh, protection. So, and they are also subcontracted for uh, full-time full riders, uh, those, and the riders hired by restaurants and the crowdsourced uh, riders. Crowdsourced riders is the equivalent to, you know, independent and self-employed. Uh, riders. However, um, so I, I, okay. However, I, I will I will talk about however later. So uh, workers indeed, as you have already noticed, perhaps workers in these different types, uh, uh, they don't they, they not only differ in their uh, contractual relationship, institutional labor protections, the schemes of pay and benefits, but also have different level of flexibility, gradually flexibility. Uh, crowdsourced here, you know, uh, the, uh, the lowest uh, uh, column uh, row uh, by one, 
Here, crowd social riders are presumably to be uh, self-employed, so they enjoy more uh, uh, scheduling flexibility than uh, the subcontractor riders who usually work uh, full-time on fixed schedule. However, uh, since 2018, uh, here is an example uh, uh, for uh, Meituan, uh, which is now the dominant uh, food delivery platform in China. Uh, a subcategory actually within the crowdsourced uh, uh, riders uh, emerge is called a le pao. Le pao meaning, uh, literally meaning uh, running the errand happily. So le pao uh, was created, you know, within this, uh, this category. And as you can see, others, uh, you know, casual, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the contractual relations, no, no base salary, no uh, social security contributions. Uh, well, pay system is the same, dynamic rate and, uh, um, and with incentives. However, they actually, uh, they are ineffective, have minimum uh, uh, flexible schedule, uh, scheduling flexibility because the platform required them to uh, fulfill, uh, fulfill a required number of orders, stay online for minimum nine hours per day with, uh, with four hours uh, in the, during the peak time, and they have limited rights to reject uh, assigned orders, which is very different from other uh, crowd, crowd riders. So technically self-employed, Lepau actually, Lepau riders actually face a very strict labor control with very limited uh, flexibility in exchange for priorities in the order allocation algorithm. So again, instead, uh, well, uh, uh, indeed, subcontracting or you know, these, uh, these layers of uh, temp staffing agencies, uh, again, it's not new in China. And the, the proliferation of work types indicates a continued change of multiplication of labor. Um, the multiplication of, multiplication of labor uh, and uh, which actually, you know, uh, uh, which actually helped to generate a relative, uh, uh, relative uh, surplus value uh, for the capital uh, accumulation. However, the prevailing mandate of growth before profit in the platform capitalism has pushed the labor market vol uh, volatility to a new level. Uh, well, here is only you know, horizontal because you can see all different types of, uh, of, of workers. I'm going to give you a like chronological uh, snapshot. So take, um, Take the food delivery platform, Meituan, as an example. The labor management structure of workers has been constantly morphing from, you know, from the foundation of the company uh, till these days. Uh, prior to its IPO, which I trace it back here, as you can, as you can tell, uh, they, have, they have only like platform hired writers. Uh, as I have stressed, now they no longer exist. So prior to its IPO, large investment Allow the, allow the company to heavily subsidize customers and food delivery uh, riders to build both the supply and the demand of its multi-sided market. Initially, the food delivery workers hired by the platform had relatively stable income and access to social securities and the labor protection. Uh, then a variety of working ar arrangement has been created and utilized by the platform to help create market dominance. This instability of the platform structure the pace of its um, metamorphosis and the platform centralized the power to control the labor process, regardless of the uh, workers' types, invite us to connect the labor process to the capitalistic exploitation and valorization. For dominant platform companies, labor process management has become a channel to regulate the labor force in, in an entire sector. So the monopolies or duopolies in specific sectors are very common in, uh, platform, in, in platform economy, uh, part, partly thanks to the network effect and the financialized capitalism and, the, uh, and the, in China specifically, the, the permissive regulatory environment I discussed earlier. So for example, uh, uh, as I have already mentioned, uh, ride hailing sector is controlled by Didi. Uh, Chocolate logistics are dominated by Mambang and another platform called Holala. And the food delivery services is dominated by Meituan and uh, Alibaba owned uh, Elma. So the platform centralized the power to manage the work through one or two apps and organize tens of millions of workers in the entire sector is unprecedented 
in China as well as, well as elsewhere. So as I, uh, as I have said that, you know, uh, uh, at the very beginning, I presented the figure. So specifically, there are, uh, there are um, 580,000 to 10 million registered truck drivers on intra-city uh, freight uh, logistic platforms and over 20 million uh, drivers on the ride hailing platforms. So to put these numbers in perspective, Foxicom, you know, the world largest manufacturing company to assemble electronics, employed about 1.4 million Chinese workers at its peak time, when there were about 9 million workers in the electronic manufacturing alone nationwide. So operating in multi-sided market, the platform companies have, have also accumulated much data about the supply and demand, uh, they deployed the ag aggregation as well as uh, uh, segregation and fragmentation power to assemble, disassemble, and reassemble the workforce to meet their evolving interests and goals. As you can see from this slide, before and after its IPO may transfer restructuring of the labor management corresponds to its shifting priority from market dominance to profitability. Years of losing money turned into profitability in 2018, which is the year when it went public. So the profit Meituan made from food delivery businesses actually doubled, according to its financial report, from uh, 2018 to 2020. But the company insists on uh, maintaining its market dominance as well as driving down the operational cost, which basically is another term to refer to riders' wages in its financial reports in order to please its investors. So the platform's labor uh, management structure is likely to continue. Well, it won't surprise me if they, they created uh, you know, other types of other subcategories because it serves the interests of the monopoly uh, capital. Armed by a cybernetic view right, on the market, both on supply and uh, uh, demand side to maximize its capital accumulation, Monopolistic or duplistic uh, platforms would render certain workers to be obsolete. Destabilize workers' situated knowledge about the system uh, and making the exercises of their collective agency contingent on day-to-day -day survival issues and the proper working of the system. So I keep wondering, actually, the digital tailorism, you know, to describe the, uh, the heightened control that uh, workers face on a, day, on, a, on a daily basis, is actually, uh, it's, it's actually more than digital tailorism. I would, I, I would actually rather call it, you know, digital tailorism turns into digital Darwinism because only the fittest will survive. And the, the, here, the fittest only include those who will serve the evolving interests of the platform. Uh, so closely related, okay, these are the uh, closely related to the multiplication of labor is the proliferation of intermediaries, which is caused by the dominance of informal economy, regulatory uh, loopholes, and the lax labor law enforcement. The roles played by intermediaries include, but are not limited to, and is not restricted to the labor platforms. As you can see, the third one here is the uh, you know live streaming one. So the roles. Uh, include but are not limited to being a labor recruiter, manager, trainer, being the incubator for the content creators, as well as being the creditor. Some studies actually have showed that the intermediate, you know, labor agencies diffuse collective contention and offer some room of negotiation between the managers and the workers. Uh, nonetheless, the expensive roles played by the intermediaries complicated and obscure the, manufacturing, uh, the, the managerial relations as well as responsibilities uh, for workers. It makes them very, very difficult to defend and protect themselves, uh, even in front of the, uh, even, uh, even when they choose to use the labor law. Uh, the platform, platform based workers face management through algorithms, uh, human managers, customers, or fans, and here, you know, when applicable, uh, creditors. Intermediary organization. Uh, organizations help externalize the risk and responsibilities from the platform companies onto the workers, which leads to a convergence of labor struggles with livelihood struggles for workers. For example, several drivers actually led protesting against the ride-hailing platforms, not 
about the uh, algorithms or pay or anything related to their work conditions, but because of its own program. So the third characteristic here, uh, the third characteristic of the transformation of work in the digital uh, platform economy is concerned with the contradiction between the monopolistic platform and, uh, as I've mentioned, that actually China uh, has been has been an infrastructure state uh, for a long time. You know, by investing into railroads, uh, high high speed uh, yeah high speed railroads and roads networks, as well as telecom uh, infrastructure. So um, and uh, uh, and then later on, I'm going to uh, hang on. Sorry. I forgot to collect this. Uh, yeah, the contradictions between uh, monopolistic uh, platforms and the infrastructure state. Then I will move on to talk about the labor struggles, old and new. So pointing to the untracked decision-making power con uh, concentrated in the hands of platform companies, many scholars pointed out that they started to, uh, you know, the digital platforms started to play the role of uh, of infrastructure determining the rules of interaction and transactions for the parties operating on it, including workers, consumers, merchants, and in some cases, developers. Uh, for platform workers, the infrastructure the platforms are both the point of production and the means of production. However, China has been, has been a infrastructure state long before the rise of digital platforms, constructing uh, as I've mentioned, as I've mentioned, constructing railway roads and the internet networks, digital platforms depend on and intersect with these infrastructures of its, uh, uh, for its operation. As Ling and Pan uh, recently argued that a mode of infrastructure capitalism is unfolding in China's platform economy, which involves the private capital and the state and goes beyond the digital layer of platforms. So I would actually want I, I would want uh, I want to kind of like expand from uh, Ling and Pang's point uh, by saying that an important technological factor contributing to the concentration of the power in the hands of the platforms is their data power. Data are collected to train and improve the algorithms and used to sustain the operation of the platforms. The volume of data also contributes to the market speculation of the company's value. As I and uh, uh, Chiu co-wrote an article and argued elsewhere, in the labor process of uh, the platform work, workers are subjected to a more granular data extraction than customers or restaurants or other organizational uh, parties in the collection of their behavioral uh, mobility and the biometrical data. The platform mediated capitalistic uh, production thus evolves the service provided by workers and data extracted from them, although the latter is often uh, invisibilized. So living labor for data production becomes indispensable in the operation of the so-called infrastructuralized platform. Here I'm quoting uh, Pang Tang and others work, uh, which makes the infrastructure less stable and exposes the contradiction in the, cap uh, in the platform capitalism uh, in uh, its contention against uh, the state. So the concentration of those decision power in hands of platform in China poses certain threats to the state. According to Wen Hong Chen's study of platform uh, of technology policies in China, the state actually tried to uh, balance three different goals, uh, including cyber sovereignty, uh, political stability, and uh, economic growth in its national strategy. But massive data power and the quasi-regulatory power to govern the workforce in one uh, sector by one or two platform companies uh, have generated tensions with the state uh, other two goals. And this is the second contradiction uh, in China's infrastructure uh, capitalism. So Didi's recent you know, IPO fiasco uh, and uh, uh, in the past three, uh, in the past two months, several high profile regulatory interventions into the internet sectors including the uh, issuance of a na national uh, guideline to protect uh, platform workers in July, suggests that the state actually uh, is attempting to diffuse the tension and rebalance these three goals. However, I have to say, uh, the actual compliances of those guidelines uh, are remain to be seen. So, okay, infra uh, implications for uh, labor struggles. So in China's contemporary you know, um, platform uh, economy, 
Uh, labor struggles continue over the issues related to pay, uh, work conditions, labor protections, and so on. And labor disputes uh, initiated by individuals in the form of attribution and laws, uh, lawsuits on their uh, employee status are on the rise, which is actually similar to uh, what's happening in other countries, including uh, US, Canada, uh, uh, France. Um, however, as discussed earlier, because of the mediation of the third party agencies or temp staffing agency, it is rare to hold the platform companies accountable, even if worker, workers actually won the cases for their employment status. Um, the collective actions remain to be localized as well as short lived. These you know, uh, struggles around the old issues uh, are not categorically different from uh, well, how the industrial workers have, have been struggling and organizing themselves. What is more important actually is the new terrains of struggles uh, in the workplace and beyond for the platform workers, including their representative voices in, uh, in algorithmic design and operation, uh, their privacy and their data rights, or even their uh, collective rights to the data dividends right, uh, generated from the value their, their, their labor, uh, their data labor uh, help create. So uh, overall, okay, my talk is, uh, can be uh, seen as my attempt to unlearn the platform-centric epistemology. I approach platforms as the site where multiple geographical and historical agents, such as countries, nation states, workers, and staffing agencies converge and manifest their uh, actions in relation to the operation of capital, movement of labor, institutions of employment and finance, and the digital technologies. Along with other scholars, I emphasize the dependence of the markets enclosed and uh, constituted within the digital platforms on other markets and the existing employment in institutions and labor management practices. The case of ride hailing platforms and food delivery apps I, I detailed in this talk oriented toward locality as they only facilitate local, you know, location-based on-demand service. Or maybe one can say that they are only Chinese platforms because they look, they, they located in China and they have very, uh, very uh, little, uh, you know, transnational presence. Uh, although Didi, you know, the right hailing platform started to have strategic partnership with uh, the local partners in other countries. But, but nonetheless, these actually platforms are global too, I would argue, because the flow and convergence of the overseas and domestic capital, the worldwide onslaught of neoliberalism to informalize the workforce, which in China manifests in the transition away from the socialist regime of work welfare, uh, and a rapid uh, integration of China's economy and production regime into the global capitalism, which actually leads to a shared experience between Chinese workers and uh, uh, workers in other countries in the lack of institutional labor production, you know, uh, both in China uh, as in other developed and uh, developed countries. So all of these actually all constitute the global, which I call the global conditions for the workers' experience. Uh, well, platform-based workers' experience in China. The pandemic in the last year, or, or, or more than uh, more than twelve months in the past, at also lays bare the violent digital inclusion into the platform economy they cause in the name of job opportunities or uh, job creation. So to confront those violences, the workplace uh, labor politics must move beyond platform-centric or uh, work, work or occupational oriented struggles. And uh, thank you for listening, uh, that's it.